This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. So did you tell me earlier that you ordered a 3D printer? Yeah, you know what? I, I mentioned it in passing, and I realized now that you're asking me that I didn't actually tell you that I did it. Yes. So after my... I know you talked about it a while ago on the podcast, but I had not heard any more about it. So I got a, a, a Prusa uh, i3 MK3S, <laughs> which based on my research is uh, one of the one of the best units out there, period. And for the price is, yeah, just a seems to be the one to get. So I ordered it. It takes a bit of time for them to actually ship it. But I think that was a few weeks ago now that I ordered it. So I should get it. Uh, should get it soon. And what do you plan on making with it? Well, the most pressing project that we have in mind is uh, a 3D printed weapon for the Lego BattleBots that we <laughs> often build. <laughs> we, we have we have a couple of weighted Lego pieces that came with an old boat set that I had when I was a kid. Um, so they're designed to sort of ballast the boat to keep it stable. Uh, and, and they have, I don't know, some kind of metal weights in them. So we often make weapons out of those it's like a spinning weapon it's called a kinetic weapon for a battle bot um the way that and it, it, it works pretty well but the problem is it's lego right so if you build a big a big lego brick with weighted pieces on the end as soon as it hits something it starts to break apart pretty quickly yeah so we're going to try and 3d print a solid piece that works with lego uh anyway that's our that's our first our first project idea um cool. i might custom build a foosball table with my dad and 3d print the men it's another idea we have. That's a great idea. That'll be fun. Yep. Awesome. On my front, I just hit my 300th ride on Peloton. Wow. So if anyone out there is an active Peloton rider and you want to connect, I'm CP313. Maybe we can do some live rides together, which are always fun. A little bit of competition is good. Also wanted our weekly shout out to recent really kind reviews that people are leaving. Shout out to Kayfay, Nick2020, and Oler, who left nice reviews for us. Also wanted to highlight for the bad advice of the week, we've been getting some great examples of bad advice from, from listeners. There's some chat going on on Twitter as well uh, from friends and listeners of the podcast. So if you send them our way and if we use the one you send us, I'll ship you off a Rational Reminder hoodie. Seems like a pretty fair fair exchange. So just DM me on Twitter or send me an email and uh, with the article or as you'll see this week, a TikTok. Um, so Daniel from Mansell Financial Group in Tasmania, Australia, Ben, is the one who sent us the TikTok that we'll talk about today. So right now there is a hoodie somewhere between Ottawa and Tasmania. They're very nice hoodies too. They're super comfortable. Oh, I don't think I have the blue one yet. Do I get a blue one? Uh, check the stock I, if you want one. Sure, we got new charcoal ones in as well as you know charcoal. They're almost black. They're really nice. So just uh, get some help to find some bad advice of the week. And I'm sure listeners will be great help in doing that. Not that it's ever been a problem to find bad advice. No, but you never know where it's going to come from. It's kind of fun to get just to build the community and share oh, examples. It's great. And yeah, anything it's else great. to add? I don't think so. Let's go to the episode. Okay, great. Thanks for listening. Okay, so here we go, episode 115. And I must say, Ben, you had me thinking with your comment a couple of weeks ago about the value in reading these autobiographies and how they're really one-off stories and how much of value are they compared to the evidence-based thinking that we usually talk about. And so it's kind of been rolling around in my head. And then there's a Morgan Housel tweet on this, uh, if you can believe it, this week. And here's what he tweeted. A hard thing about trying to learn from successful businesses is that the same traits necessary for outlier success are often the same traits that increase the odds of failure. The line between bold and reckless can be thin. Same thing for investors. Makes sense. Taking more concentrated bets yeah. seems sensible. Anyways, I, I I just find them really interesting, and maybe it's just a phase I'm going through now. 
And the reality is our lives are full of randomness and the more we can, I think, learn from other people. Like I think a lot of what I've been reading just kind of seeps into your minds. You never know when it's going to pop up as you make decisions in your own life. You know, I think about a recent interview that um, Shopify founder Toby Lutke had with Patrick O'Shaughnessy, just talking about the benefits of reading all sorts of different books and, and ideas because you never do know how it's going to filter its way through and help you create your own story. So I think that's probably even true beyond autobiographies. It's probably even extends into nonfiction. Absolutely. Or or, uh, fiction, sorry. For sure. Anyways, I've been reading a ton of these of late. Um, The one I wanted to talk about this week, which was of interest to me because of his name in the investment industry. So the book is called Zero to One. Notes on Startups and or How to Build a Future by Peter Thiel. So I'm sure many, many people have heard of Peter Thiel, uh, but may not know much about him. Like I've heard of him for years, but I don't know much about him at all. But he's a German-born Silicon Valley billionaire and venture capitalist. He's a co-founder of PayPal, as well as Palantir Technologies. He's also very well known for his VC fund, the Founders Fund, which, get this, has invested in companies such as Airbnb, Stripe, SpaceX, Spotify, Lyft, Oculus, Credit Karma, and many others. It's a pretty crazy list of companies. Anyways, and he was also Facebook's first outside investor back in 2004. He put in uh, $500,000 and it became worth a billion dollars in 2012. Jeez. Yeah, it, it's amazing. He's been the center of a lot of this. The story gets better. But anyways, the point of zero to one is, and it's all about innovation. And he says the kind of change that innovation can have and how to question what is possible can lead you to these unexpected outcomes. And he believes that innovation can happen in any industry. And he's not just talking about tech led, but it's all about thinking differently and creating something that can be totally different in a marketplace. And he says that tomorrow's champions will not win by c- competing in today's marketplace. He says you have to do something completely new in order to go from zero to one. And he gives all kinds of examples. For example, if you imagine deciding today, okay, I think we can we can compete in the search engine function. Well, not very likely. Or the on-demand streaming service, not likely. But those companies went to a place that they saw something that was missing and created it. Um, in terms of examples of zero to one, get this. Peter Thiel was part of the what's been called the PayPal Mafia which is a group of employees at PayPal that after they left PayPal, they went on to found other companies and get this for a list. Tesla, SpaceX, LinkedIn, YouTube, Yelp, and Yammer were all created by people that worked at PayPal. Crazy. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that is. Anyways, quickly go through. One of the big takeaways for me was how he describes the seven questions every new business must answer. Number one is the engineering question. Can you create a breakthrough technology instead of just incremental improvements? The timing question, is now the right time to start your particular business? The monopoly question, are you starting with a big share of a small market, you know, the minimum viable product idea? The people question, do you have the right team? The distribution question, do you have a way to not just create, but deliver your product? The durability question, will your market position be defensible in 10 and 20 years into the future? And the secret question, have you identified a unique opportunity that others don't see? So we asked this question in the book, what is something that you think is true, but that most people disagree with you on? If you just think back to when companies like Tesla, like Google were being created, just imagine how they thought about that question back then before they actually became what they are today. Yeah. All companies are different, he explains. He says each one earns a monopoly by solving a unique, a unique problem. And he says all failed companies are the same. They fail to escape competition. So the four main rules he suggests to follow are make incremental advances. So it's kind of the James Clear Atomic Habits idea. Stay lean and flexible. Improve in the competition. And focus on product, not on sales. Yeah, I like that. 
Anyways, really good book. I enjoyed it. It's a neat story for someone who's, I mean, you and I have heard his name for a long time, but I wanted to learn more about him. So I recommend it. Cool. I, uh, I didn't put it on our notes camera, but I have a, I have a couple books <laughs> that I've read. Well, one, one that I've read and one that I'm in the process of reading. So there's one book by uh, Francis Coppola, who's a, a, a journalist or a writer in the UK, uh, but she came from a banking background. And when I was going through that whole phase of research and quantitative easing and the financial market and economic impacts of that, I read a lot of her articles and then I found out that she had a book that came out in 2019 uh, titled The Case for People's Quantitative Easing. And it's the premise of the book is basically some policy suggestions on how quantitative easing could have been done better. Because at the end of the day, quantitative easing in 2008 ended up resulting in a big wealth transfer to, uh, well, to the banking system, mm -hmm. to, to, the, to the banks and to the corporations, to, to, to the people that held government securities that could be purchased through bank reserves. Uh, and I think, I think Jim Stanford talked about this when, when we had him on on too is is the, the 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 increasing potential for increasing inequality from quantitative easing. So anyway, the, the main premise of, of her book is to suggest some alternatives. One of which I think would line up with um, what what's been happening this time around, where the government has been distributing large amounts uh, of cash directly to people uh, through stuff in Canada, like the CERB uh, and all the other benefits that have that have come out. I think so. This book was written in 2019, obviously before all this happened. Um, my, my guess is that if if we asked her, is what the government's doing now closer in line with what you were thinking? My guess is she would say yes. Anyway, the best part of the book, though, is not actually the policy discussion, which was interesting and gives you a lot of context to think about how all these mechanisms work together. But the most interesting part was just her discussion on how the monetary system works and how quantitative easing fix, fits into it. So kind of like the the thing we did on the podcast a while ago, where I tried to yeah. explain it. Um, and I mentioned Jim Stanford's book goes over this. I mentioned Pragmatic Capitalism by a guy named Colin Rush that, that goes over the same thing. Her book, People's Quantitative Easing, um, it, its overview of the monetary system was as good, if not better, than any of the other ones that I've read so far. And did anything in that book conflict with what you learned? Not at all. In your deep dive, so it just cemented it. Cemented it further. More, Excellent. more context. More, more. Uh, yeah, more, more re reiteration of the same ideas. Now, to be fair, she was a source for a lot of my research to begin with. Like a lot of her articles helped me think through all of this. So it makes sense that it didn't disagree with anything that I thought I understood. Um, so there's another book yeah, that we all have to read. That was, that was a really good one. And I've got one more. Fire away. <laughs> so uh, a, a podcast listener sent me a suggestion for a book called "The Master Switch: The Rise and Fall of Information Empires." by Tim Wu. And the, the, the reason that they suggested it was our discussion on the largest companies uh, historically, and AT&T uh, being specifically covered in this book, uh, The Master Switch. But it talks through the, the different em information empires that have existed over time, uh, like television, radio, uh, telephones. Um, and I haven't read the whole book yet, but the premise is fascinating. So his, his economic theory is that there's something that he names the cycle and the cycle can happen or ha has happened the same for every for every uh, information technology that, that has existed in in the past. And his hypothesis is that the same thing is going to happen with the internet. So basically it starts wow. out as a, as a very open technology that's, that's sort of that open source idea and easily accessible to everyone. But then over time, economic forces... Uh, drive it toward being a very closed system like we've seen with cable television and um, radio and all that kind of stuff. So you end up with this consolidation and these extremely large players that control the whole ecosystem and it stops being open and free and that drives people to create a new technology, which wow. is what the internet is now. But his, like in the introduction of the book, uh, the last the last sentence is fascinating, the last couple sentences. Um, so he, he talks about how, the, he talks about the cycle Um but I'll just, I'm just going to read the last couple of sentences. So he says, in fact, the place we find ourselves now is a place we have been before, albeit, albeit in a different guise. And, and so understanding how the fate of the technologies of the 20th century developed is important in making the 21st century better. So he's basically saying, like, what has happened with past technologies, as different and unique as we think the Internet is, it's not. It's just like everything else before it, uh, just a different technology. And yeah, so he, he's saying... 
that uh, the, the world is not so different as we think it is. And Google's not so um, unprecedented as, as people tend to think it is when you look at past information empires. Interesting. We will yeah. add that to our book list. Yeah, and I've got to finish reading it, but I, yeah, I, th- I thought just just the premise alone was very interesting. Awesome. So another news you wanted to talk about the Ontario Securities Commission Investor Experience Study. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting to to talk about. It was a an online survey of one thousand nine hundred and forty two Canadian investors, um, conducted between April first to twelfth, with a bit of a, a, a yep. I was going to say, that's a really interesting time to have done this because that is like three and four weeks after, or not even two and three weeks after the crisis when it hit the markets the worst. Yep. Which is probably why I'm, I'm guessing why they did it because yep. there, there were questions related to the, to the crisis. Uh, so to qualify for the responses to be counted, um, the respondents had to own at least one of the following stocks, ETFs, uh, including read ETFs, Canada savings bonds, bonds, um, mutual funds, guaranteed investments, segregated funds, a pension plan through their employer, or other types of securities and derivatives. And if they only had Canada savings bonds, segregated funds, or a pension plan, only one of those things, they were excluded from the survey. Uh, and then they had to invest in one of the following ways, with an advisor, with an online investment service, which I'm guessing is a robo-advisor, or as a mm-hmm. self-directed investor. So the three main types, I guess, of investors. And this seems a lot like, uh, if people remember when Preet Banerjee was on as a guest, the, the research that he was talking about for his PhD dissertation or DBA dissertation was was a lot like uh, this, although I'm sure his is more in depth. Anyway, um, so some of the key takeaways from the survey, 68% of the respondents own mutual funds, 48% own stocks, 46% have a pension plan, 37% of GICs, 19% have ETFs. Interesting there to see the relatively low weight in ETFs compared to mutual funds, which lines up with the, the asset weights that exist. And a much higher weight in pension plans than I would have guessed. Now, I know they're not all DB plans, but still 46% in a pension plan is higher than I would have guessed. Yeah. And the percent working with an, an advisor was also interesting. And it may speak to the, again, the, the massive weight we have still in commission-based mutual funds in Canada. Uh, so 77% of respondents have an advisor. Uh, of the 23% that don't, 38% of those say that it was because the advisors are too expensive. Uh, and 25% say it's because they don't trust financial advisors. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah. But a pretty yeah. high satisfaction number, 74% were very or somewhat satisfied with only 6% somewhat or very dissatisfied. So that's a good news story, I guess. And you know what? We 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 cut out something else that we thought we might talk about, which was the um, title regulation in Ontario for the title of financial planner, and that that actually ties in really well with this survey with that that relatively low trust level based on this survey for the financial advice business. And that so Ontario is rolling out, we're starting to roll out legislation that will protect the title of financial planner and financial advisor. Yeah. So you'll you'll actually have to have <laughs> some credentials yeah, to say that you are one of those things. So we'll keep that on the agenda for two weeks down the road. We will go into details on that, but it's good to see those initiatives coming. Uh, 55% have never switched advisors, but 7% would like to. That number has come down. I remember a number, oh, I'm sure it's 10, 15 years ago, where the number that wanted to switch was, I believe it was over 20% wanted to switch in a survey back then. 83% 83% are satisfied with the service and advice from their advisor. And 50% of investors have their financial advisor as their primary source of information for buy or sell decisions. Yeah. So, so when you look at a, a number of different aspects, including overall return, performance versus goals, fees, change of value of each investment, and return comparison to other similar investments, get this, this is the thing that blew me away. The average investor spends 170 minutes per month monitoring these five items. That's almost three hours a month. Wow. Like, uh, I don't believe it. That's the average. I don't believe it, but maybe. Uh, Another good news piece in here is that the majority find it easy to find information. However, 68% 
have at least one challenge, with the biggest challenge being the need for more knowledge. Just tell them about our podcast. Yeah. Um, we talked about frauds and scams uh, quite a bit on, on this podcast. Another stat here, only 10% believe that they're likely to fall for a fraud or scam. And they had some COVID specific data, which was quite interesting. So 74% uh, of respondents had had communication from or discussions with their advisor uh, during this crisis period, which means 26% had none. Now think uh, of the time frame though. This is pretty, pretty fresh after the crisis happening. So I think 74% getting communication that quickly is pretty good. Yeah, true. Uh, 81% of investors re uh, rated the advice that they received as excellent, very good or good. So that's, that's good. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we would agree. I wonder if we would look at the advice that they've received and agree whether it was good or not. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's enough for the survey. That's the, were there any other main ones that you wanted to touch on. I think that those are the, well, the one that caught me is they asked a bunch of, uh, skill questions. You know, like it, there's five different skill questions, like an inflation number, a growth number. Um, and, and there were five relatively easy questions. Only 23% got all five questions correctly. And only 35% of people knew that bond prices fall if interest rates rise. Yeah. Makes me wonder again, if uh, the people that said that the advice they receive is good, I wonder if we would agree, and then give them the chance. A, attitude toward risk question, you know, one of those gambling questions that we've talked about in the past and only 17% of respondents acted rationally on the, on the bet question. Um, again, not, not necessarily surprising, but I would have guessed that more people have not acted rationally, mathematically. So interesting survey. We'll have it up in the show notes. Yep. So you want to jump to the main portfolio topic? Yep, sure. I, I, it is kind of cool, just as a side note, that that the OSC is conducting surveys like this. Kind of neat. Okay, yeah. So for our, our portfolio topic, I wanted to talk about actively managed funds versus the COVID-19 crisis. So where did this question come from? Uh, it's been rattling around in my head for a while. Um, and I've been looking for su stuff like the Spiva report or something to, to come out so that I had actually had some data to speak about it. I guess I could have built my own data set of Morningstar, but it's a, it's a bit of a bit of a monster to try and do that well. Um, yeah. But what, what changed and why I decided to cover this now is that uh, Morningstar released their active passive fund barometer, which has a lot of similar-ish data to the Spiva reports. Um, which was good. And then the other thing that really kicked me into gear to cover this was uh, a paper from a couple of people at the University of Chicago, um, of course, that analyzing exactly the question, how, how have actively managed mutual funds done throughout the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, so we'll talk about that paper and the Morningstar Active Passive Fund Barometer, uh, as well as a couple of other data points. But so I think everyone- Intuitively, you can think of a lot of, investors might think this should be an easy time to make a lot of money if you time this properly. Well, that's, that is the narrative. That's the narrative. That's something actually that I want to do uh, a video on eventually is, is, um, is it profitable to buy the dip? Cause people never think about the other side of buying the dip. Buying the dip means by definition, you had cash before the dip. Right. Um, I think I built a model about this a while ago and, and it, it, you know, you, you, your, your opportunity cost of sitting in cash outweighs the benefits of being able to buy the dip. Anyway, that's a total digression, but that'd be a whole other interesting topic to, mm -hmm. to cover. Uh, okay. So the, the, the common narratives around active management, it's like what you said, Cameron, uh, suggest that periods of high volatility, wider return dispersion across securities. So some stuff doing really poorly, some stuff doing really well, uh, price dislocations or so-called price dislocations, as I refer to my notes, cause exactly. I, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, but all those things combined create opportunities for active managers to beat the index and actively managed funds just happen to be a really nice proxy for active managers in general, because the data is public the data are public. And of course you want your active manager to be nimble. That's always you hear people saying now's the time to be nimble. 
Got to be able to respond to those price dislocations and yeah. Quickly. Quickly, right. So g- given that narrative, obviously, as, as we've been talking about it, you would, you would imagine, and imagine maybe the key word there, but you'd imagine that 2020 was or has been like the best time in history for active managers. So of course, the, the point of this section is to see how those narratives stand up to our friend, the, the data. Right. So to take, take a bit of a step back real quick, um, just on active management in bear markets in general, there's a paper that Vanguard did in 2019 where they looked specifically at Canadian active fund returns for three past market cycles. So two bull markets and one bear market to see over, over those time periods, did active funds on average beat the index or their respective indexes? And the results showed a lack of consistency, which is basically what we've seen in past reports like this. Um, in, in some cycles, some fund categories, you know, more than half beat the index. But in other cycles, different categories have the same thing happen. On average, it's, a, it's roughly a coin flip in these extreme periods, in the bull markets and the bear markets. Now, they didn't have a ton of data for Canada, so they also, as a robustness check, looked at U.S. equity funds, uh, over six bear markets dating back to 1980, and again, the results were mixed. And I think that U.S. data they pulled from a paper that we've cited on this podcast in the past where it, it, was, it was mixed. I mean, sometimes, sometimes the average active fund did a little better during a crisis, sometimes they did a little worse, but there's no clear, obvious mm. advantage and then on top of that, we know uh, longer term, like not just in a crisis, but in general, active funds tend to underperform. But in a crisis, it seems to be a little closer to 50-50, um, which is interesting. And I think one of the reasons for that is probably that active funds in general, like not, not just in a crisis because they can't time that, but in general, active funds tend to hold cash because like you said, Cameron, they've got to be, they've got to be nimble. They've got to be ready, looking for opportunities. So they'll, they'll tend to have higher cash balances <laughs> than an index fund. Dry, if you think about it, dry powder. Yeah, the dry powder, right? Um, but if the average active fund, I don't know, just as an example, say they're holding fifteen percent cash all the time on average. If there's a sudden unexpected drop, just by nature of that, they're going to do a little better um, than than an index fund that holds no cash. Yeah, that doesn't mean they're going to outperform on average over the long term. But in a crisis, in that extreme drawdown situation, you can see how the average active fund would do a little better um, than the average. Index fund, and they actually don't. It's 50-50. But you could see <laughs> if the data showed that active funds did a little better, you could see why. Uh, okay, so that kind of, kind of sets the stage. Um, so now let's talk about the the Morningstar U.S. Active Passive Fund Barometer, which I, I think you can get publicly. I got it through Morningstar Direct. Uh, I think if you give your email address, then they'll, they'll let you see the report, though. Um, so th- this covers 4,400 unique U.S equity funds. Uh, and it, so that accounts for $13.1 trillion in fund assets, which is a lot. Crazy. Eh? It's crazy. <laughs> That's a lot. Um, so a- active funds performance through the first half of 2020 uh, showed that across all 20 fund categories they examined in the report, 51% of active funds both survived and outperformed their average index fund peer. And that's actually an important point. In this, in this study, they use uh, active funds against index funds, not active funds against indexes, but against index funds. Hmm. So that's that's important because obviously index funds have fees and costs, indexes don't. So 51% of active funds this year, uh, and in the first half of this year, 51% survived and outperformed their average passive index fund peer. And that maybe speaks to that idea I was talking about a minute ago with active funds tending to hold a bit more cash, which gives them a bit of a cushion in a crash. But so does that, all, that, that number strike you as being higher than you would have guessed? Well, no, because of what I've been saying about the cash. Like I think if in, in, a, in a quick, unexpected downturn, if the average active fund more cash than the average passive fund, which certainly will be, I don't think that's unexpected. But I think where we where get caught is on the recovery. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Oh, they also look at bond funds. And the bond funds were an interesting point because uh, 
well, there was an extreme event that happened right in the middle of that, like the week of March 23rd, when the spreads widened like crazy. And yes, and bond funds don't tend to hold cash like equity funds do. So think about what's going on. If there was a demand for redemptions in these funds on the active funds, it's almost like their performance would be driven more by fund flows than by what their portfolio was actually in. Or is that an accurate statement necessarily? You think about the complexity going on there. Yeah. So I think f fire sales could have had, could have had a bit of an impact. Uh, and I actually think that the, the, the Chicago study that I mentioned did talk about fire sales. I don't know if I dug too much into that section of the paper though. Um, anyway, so 40% of active bond funds, uh, in the intermediate core corporate and high yield bond categories survived and beat their average passive counterpart. So lower obviously than the equity on the equity side. Uh, and, and this, this study attributes it to bond funds being caught in a period that punished credit risk and re rewarded interest rate risk as credit spreads widened and rates fell. So that's, that's what they're saying caused, mm -hmm. uh, ca caused the underperformance relative to the passive peers. Uh, they also looked at some longer term data in this report. Uh, so over the trailing 10 years, the, the cheapest funds succeeded. Succeeded means survived and surpassed their benchmark. The cheapest funds succeeded about twice as often as the most expensive ones. So 34% success rate versus 16%. And over the 10 year period ending June 30th, 2020, oh, over the, sorry, over the 10 year period in June, June 30th, 2020. Um, yeah. So that, oh, and the survival rate was much much lower as well for more expensive funds. Right. That's what you'd expect. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think that's good for that, for that report. And then I, I also looked at the European active passive barometer. So same, same idea. And I won't go through all the details of this report, uh, but it, it looked at nearly 22,600 unique active and passive European domiciled funds that account for 3.7 trillion euro in assets. And in this case, for the same period, so for the first six months of 2020, only about half of active stock funds and one third of active fixed income funds, so similar-ish to the yep. US data, uh, beat their average passive peer over the period. Right. It's pretty much what you'd expect. Uh, so this ne the, the, the next piece is the, the paper titled Mutual Fund Performance and Flows During the COVID-19 Crisis. Uh, so this is published in August, not peer-reviewed yet. So fresh off the, off the press, pre-peer review or any publication or anything like that. Um, but it's from a couple of people at the University of Chicago. Uh, one of them is Lubo Pastor. I'm, I probably butchered the pronunciation of the name. Uh, but he's written many, many papers that we've cited on the podcast and used in different pieces of research. So how did you find this paper? I think because I, this has been rattling around in my head, I've been doing intermittent Google searches and SSRN searches for um, active fund performance during COVID-19. And it, this is just the first time that I actually got enough um, meaningful results to, to cover it as a topic. Uh, so the, the, the premise of this paper is that they're testing the hypothesis that investors are willing to tolerate, and this is actually really interesting, they're testing the hypothesis that, act, that investors are willing to tolerate active management's underperformance because active funds outperform in periods that are particularly important to investors, like mm. a crisis. So that's an interesting concept. Maybe people are, act, like, because uh, one of the things they talk about in the introduction of this paper is why, why is the active management business still so huge if it underperforms and everybody knows it. And there's an obvious alternative in index funds. So one might be, I'm willing to have an active manager because they do hold dry powder in case of a crisis. And I'm, that's or, a preference I might have. Yeah. And I, they probably not even dry. I, I think it's probably less on the opportunity side. Like I want to take advantage of a crisis and it's probably more on the... Um, Protection? Yeah. On the not wanting to lose all of your money in a, in a crisis would be my... My guess. And so like we've talked about uh, as we introduce this section, the authors of the paper suggest that this crisis was, you know, as good as anything in history. 
to test this hypothesis uh, because there was a big output contraction. There was the fastest increase in unemployment on record. Um, we, we had uh, the, the so-called price dislocations in, in asset prices. So it's easy to see how this could be considered a great mm -hmm. opportunity for active managers. Um, so they talk about, well, they, yeah, so they talk about the price dislocations and they give a couple of examples, uh, which I wanted to mention. Uh, they, they talked about how the S and P 500, S and P 500 index experienced its steepest drop in living memory, losing 34% of its value between February 19th and March 23rd before bouncing back by over 30% by the end of April. So everyone kind of lived through that. This isn't market history at this point. It's, well, I guess it is history, but very recent history. Uh, and they talked about how in the bond market, liquidity evaporated, like you mentioned that, Cameron, in yep. March 2020 for um, corporate bonds and for U.S. Treasuries, which was unusual. They're usually very liquid. Uh, the Federal Reserve stepped in to resolve some of that. But before they did, there were some pretty serious, what you might call pricing anomalies, uh, like the corporate bond market, which I think you were talking about when you were mentioning the uh, redemptions, Cameron, the, uh, bonds were trading at big discounts Two credit default swaps. Incredible week. That was to see the eight, 10, 12% spread. Just what people yeah. were willing to give up in terms of liquidity. Yeah. Now, again, to, to reiterate this, this would be an active manager's dream. If assets are departing from their, yeah. their true values, if there are these pricing dislocations, so you might expect that to be a, a, a way to find alpha, but it did make me think also about our conversation with Dave Nadek on episode in episode seventy one of, of this podcast, where he talked about for for ETFs, when the underlying assets and the ETF net, uh, the, the ETF unit values diverge, he, he talks about how that's not a uh, that that the, the ETF structure is not broken and it's not a problem with pricing. But the ETF, the, the liquid ETF structure is creating a, a secondary pricing vector for the less liquid underlying assets. That's so exactly if you take, it. If you take that view, the, the bond prices aren't right and the ETF value is wrong. It's really that the bonds aren't getting priced because they're not trading. And the ETF values are reflecting what the bonds would be trading at if they were trading. And Dave Nada gave an example when he was a guest of, of a time when that happened with, I think, some some uh, municipal bonds or something. Yep. Um, but uh, that's, that's a different perspective to take on this, which is interesting. And then I guess the, the, the extension of that would be that if, if these price location, price dislocations are happening, um, if the underlying securities aren't actually trading, then there would be no opportunity to exploit them, which is actually exactly why that would happen, why that price dislocation would happen, because the authorized participants in the, in the ETF uh, world uh, if they're not arbitraging away those pricing discrepancies, it means that there are no actual opportunities to arbitrage them away because of a lack of liquidity. Um, anyway, so, but, but we'll go with this idea that there is, <laughs> that there are some arbitrage opportunities for uh, active managers. So now in the, in the introduction to their paper, the, the, the authors kind of give away the conclusion. Um, they say, contrary to the hypothesis that all of these I think these are my words, actually. Con contrary to the hypothesis that all these things have created opportunities for active managers to show their worth, the authors find that active funds underperform their passive benchmarks during the COVID-19 crisis. Again, no real surprise. No real surprise. So the, the crisis period as defined in this paper is between February 20th and April 30th, 2020, uh, which is a period that is roughly evenly split, and this is why they chose the period, between the crash and the recovery. Uh, and their evidence is based on daily returns of U.S. active equity mutual funds. Uh, and then they measured the performance three different ways. So they compared equity mutual funds to the S&P 500, but these aren't all U.S. equity mutual funds. So that's not always going to be a fair comparison. Uh, they compared to Morningstar designated FTSE Russell, Russell benchmarks. So those should be more appropriate. They compared to fund de fund designated prospectus benchmarks, so the benchmark that the fund itself has chosen as its benchmark, and then they use factor model benchmarks, which, as you can imagine, was my favorite part. Uh, so for S and P five hundred as, as the benchmark, they found that seventy four point two percent of active funds trailed the S and P five hundred. Now I think that's probably an artifact of 
uh, the S and P 500 or the U S stock market generally doing relatively well over this period. The recovery in U S stocks was quite strong. Uh, compared to Morningstar designated benchmarks, 57.6% of funds trailed. So that's getting a little closer to be in, in, in line with, uh, with the data that we were talking about before in, in the Morningstar report, um, compared to their prospectus benchmarks. So the, the benchmark that the funds themselves have chosen, 54.2% underperformed. Still pretty bad. <laughs> like as far as testing the hypothesis of active managers adding value in uh, in a crisis, this is, it's not promising. Yeah, I, I know, but we're all waiting for the factor numbers because we know you're getting to them. All right, it's coming. <laughs> uh, so they used CAPM, so a single market beta factor, um, Fama French three factor, Carhartt four factor, Fama French five factor, and Fama French five factor plus momentum. So a little Fama French Carhartt blend there. Otherwise known as Ben's happy place. Yes. Keep going. <laughs> um, so they're, they're on to you. They're on to who you are. They're getting you. <laughs> that's, the, that's why they're listening. They like to hear about factors. Uh, 80% of funds had negative cap M alphas. 70% had negative three factor alphas. 60% had negative four factor alphas, 68% had, had negative five factor alphas, and for the five factor plus momentum, 60% had negative alphas. Okay, plain English, what does that mean? Uh, ba based on the amount of risk that the funds were taking in these various models, the alpha is how much worse they were doing relative to the amount of risk they were taking. So, I mean, on, on average in, in most, you know, in, in all the different models of risk, um, funds were doing worse relative to the amount of risk they were taking, no matter how we try to measure measure risk. So I think of, of all of the benchmarking exercises, that's probably the most, uh, I don't know, uh, statistically meaningful. But the results actually not, not a whole lot different, no matter how we, how we do the benchmarking. Right. Uh, yeah, so they, they I mean, yeah, to, to, to put it in, in short terms, they, they found that most active funds performed poorly during the crisis. Oh, and they also found that active fund performance during the crisis was substantially worse than it was before the crisis. Wow. So that was, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't surprised to read this, it was, but it was nice to see the data. But there was an interesting thing that came out of this report that I wasn't necessarily expecting. Uh, and it, it, it ties in with, at, at the end of the episode, we're going to have a, a few words from Tim Nash, who people that listen to the podcast regularly have heard on here before. He's been on once as a guest and once as a, a special sort of appearance at the end of an episode like we're going to have today. Um, so he'll touch on this too. But this, this study looked at uh, sustainable investing. So uh, we, we, we just saw that active funds on average did poorly. Uh, but they also asked, how, did, uh, how did, did sustainable funds do anything different? And they did. And it, 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 maybe it's not enough data for this to be super meaningful, but it's still fascinating. So Morningstar assigns uh, globes, like they assign star ratings to their funds mm -hmm. or to funds in their database. They also assign globes and the globes denote sustainability. So one globe is less sustainable than five globes. Five globes is the most sustainable. And they found in the study that funds with more globes as of January 31st, 2020 had higher benchmark adjusted returns throughout the crisis. And, and this is the part that's really interesting, the relationship is monotonic across the globe categories. So five globe funds outperform four globe, which outperform three globe wow. and so on. And it's wow. a monotonic relationship, which is, yeah, fascinating. Um, and and the, the, the highest globe funds, so those with uh, three, four, or five globes, significantly outperform the remaining funds within the same investment style by an annualized 14.2% with a, with a high T-stat. I, I, I thought this was, this was just, just fascinating. Um, and if we think back, so I mentioned that we've we've talked about papers from uh, Lubos Pastor in the past, and what, one of them was uh, a paper we talked about in episode eighty-two, sustainable investing in equal sustainable investing in equilibrium, uh, where they developed a an asset pricing framework to take this into account, 
Um, but with, with their, uh, w- with their model, their model implied that assets with high sustainability ratings have lower expected returns than assets with low sustainability ratings. People may, may remember us talking about this. Um, but they also said in, in that, in that framework that, that green assets, so sustainable assets can still outperform brown assets, unsustainable assets. If investors' tastes are shifting toward green assets, or if customers' tastes are shifting toward green products, so it doesn't mean expected returns are different. It just means that the the tastes have shifted further in that direction, and that, and that right. could have been could have been what we were seeing here. Um, and it wasn't just in in performance; it was also in flows. So active funds experienced steady outflows over this period, um, but the sustainable funds, okay, so what, what one globe funds had outflows of 2.6% of assets under management through the crisis. Five globe funds had net flows of roughly zero. So more sustainable mutual funds had uh, no outflows or very close to no outflows. Okay, outflows. Okay, I got you. One globe fund suffered outflows, the money leaving of 2.6%. Gotcha. Of, of total assets, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the difference was statistically significant in flows and the authors of the paper said it's driven, especially by environmental concerns, uh, funds that apply exclusion criteria. So if they don't own any bad stuff, any sin stocks or, or unsustainable, whatever you want to call it, uh, in their, in their investment process, receive net inflows during the crisis, whereas funds with no exclusion criteria experienced outflows. Now, I also think this is fascinating from the perspective of expected returns for sustainable assets or sustainable funds or assets held by sustainable funds, because that idea of investor tastes and preferences, which we talked about, um, we talked about this in episode 82 and we covered this, but we also talked about it with Ken French in episode 100, this idea of tastes. It's like a, like a preference to hold an asset that's unrelated to uh, risk and expected return. Mm-hmm. And if people are willing to have that, or if people have that taste, they should drive if if they're large enough in numbers or if they command enough assets, they should drive the prices of whatever assets they have a taste for up, f- reducing their expected future returns. And you could argue based on what's happened during the crisis, those tastes became stronger, which means future expected returns are even lower. Now, Tim Nash is going to disagree with me on that <laughs> at the end, which is is more interesting perspective um, to have. Uh, now, one of the other things, and I, and I mentioned this in my interview with, or my, my conversation with Tim at the end, uh, before I read this paper, but one of the other possibilities that the firm, that the the paper examined was that sustainable firms engaging in sustainable activities uh, tend to be higher quality businesses. So you can use profitability in the five-factor model as a, as a proxy for quality. And they actually tested that, and they found that that did not explain the difference. Oh, really? Did yeah. not. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So they, they they added in the regression model where they were testing for uh, the preference for sustainability as driving uh, all of the stuff that we've been talking about. They they added into that model um, the, the the five factors the, the factors in the five factor model, and it did not change the explanatory power of the model. So it's it's that that preference for sustainability that was driving the differences in performance and flows based on the analysis in this in this paper so i yeah i mean pretty pretty interesting and that was kind of a you know it was interesting to read about the the performance or underperformance of of active funds in the in the crisis but that wasn't necessarily unexpected but then you tack on the concept that sustainable funds are actually doing or did better during the crisis which interestingly lines up with past research. Like other people have found that sustainable funds tend to do better in a crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd kind of heard anecdotally that sustainable investing was doing really well. Like the people that um, sort of pump that that idea um, have been celebrating the relative outperformance over this period. So it was it was interesting to see a, a proper analysis to to demonstrate that. Terrific, great insights. Planning topic. Yeah, planning. Oh, real quick, just on fire sales. So that in that same paper, they they did look at fire sales, um, and they said that their their, their evidence uh, points in the direction of fire sales, but it's not statistically reliable. So 
it's a uh, inconclusive that fire sales were driving um, major price changes. Yes, Terrific. on the planning topic now. Okay, so you found an article in the August edition of the Journal of Financial Planning, where our friend uh, Daniel Crosby, PhD, um, talked about in the article called 22 Behavioral Nudges to Optimize Client Outcomes. So this is a list of 93 behavioral interventions that was curated by the University College of London. And Daniel took 22 of those nudges and applied it to the world of finance. So Daniel Crosby, he was a, a guest with us on episode 75. He's a psychologist and behavioral finance expert with Brinker Capital in Georgia. So we thought we'd go through the 22 pieces quickly and give a little bit of our feedback on each of them. So ready to give it a go? Let's go. You start. Okay. Number one, take the long view. So people don't get the same emotion he talks about from thinking about future self versus current self. So to make the future more salient, he suggests get more detailed in the description of who you want to become. And you found an example um, where people who looked at scans of what they look like in the future actually became more committed to their plans. It's an yeah. amazing, amazing idea. Yeah. So people who are actually exposed to age avatars put nearly twice as much money into the retirement fund as other people did. Yeah, it's like they 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 had this cohort of of study participants and they took photos of them, digitally aged them, and then had people look at those pictures. I think half the group had pictures like that, half the group didn't. And then after looking at the pictures, they had to make an asset allocation decision. So they had to allocate across four four buckets, buying something nice for someone special, investing in a retirement fund, planning a fun event, or putting money into a checking account. And the subjects that were exposed to aged avatars put nearly twice as much money into the retirement fund as the other yeah. the other people. I think there's actually an app on the iPhone that does that. If you want to see what you're going to look like. Pretty, pretty fascinating. And I think it talks or it speaks to uh, the, the idea of transformation that if people remember back to the episode when we had Dennis Mosley Williams on, I don't remember which episode number that was. Um, but he, he was talking a lot about how our, how our role as people giving financial advice is, is to help people with that process of transformation, figuring out who you want to become and then becoming that, that person. And this idea of, of not, even, not only imagining, but actually looking at a picture of your future self um, mm -hmm. to, 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 make, to make thinking about that more psychologically uh, yeah. straightforward is yeah neat concept. Number two, name your dollars. And this is something we see a lot. Money is fungible, meaning that any perceived separation of dollars is not real. It's all truly one piece of an overall asset allocation. However, a lot of people do put money into buckets. And while it doesn't make sense logically, it can be used to your advantage for better behavior. So the example that I know I've seen a lot is people receive an inheritance. And they want to keep that separate from the rest of their money because Aunt Mabel wanted you to leave it alone and not touch it until you retire. So if you know that was Aunt Mabel's gift to you, you're more apt just to leave it alone. It makes no sense to keep it separate, but if it will cause better behavioral behavior, why not do it? And emergency funds are another probably good example of that, keeping keeping the separate bucket of of cash. Client directed problem solving. Investors often know what their own problems are. So instead of having someone tell you what they are, start at the source and see what ideas they have for improvements. The one example I thought of is um, a lot of people will say, I know I'm supposed to place a trade if they're managing money on their own, but I just can't hit the buy button. Yeah, I've heard that too. Uh, discrepancy between behaviors and goals. When the current behavior is discrepant with stated goals, for example, you said you wanted X, but it seems like you're doing Y, you have to help me understand why you're behaving contrary to what you said you want to do. And That's example, a question we could be asking some of I mean, anybody, if someone's managing their own money, they could ask themselves the exact same question. Well, yeah, these are all directed at us to ask clients, but there's no reason why people can't ask these of themselves. 
An example could be you say that you're long-term focused and the market volatility is historically normal. Why are you wanting to sell? And as we've said many times, it's often the story that drives the behavior. But if you said you knew this kind of volatility would happen and you said you stay long-term focused, why are you thinking about selling? Behavioral contract. So create a written contract specifying what behavior is to be performed and over what time frame. Research shows, get this, that it's even more powerful when the contract is signed. And you can think about an investment policy statement. If you sign a policy statement saying that you're going to stick to 60, 40 for the next 20 years and you sign it, arguably you're more apt to stick to it. I think the investment policy statement is a good, a good example. I also think maybe even a better example that Michael Kitts has brought up when he was on in a recent episode was the idea of a withdrawal policy statement. Because that's like asset allocation. Do people think about changing their asset allocation uh, when the market's volatile? Yeah, I find that conversation to be relatively easy. But with someone who's taking retirement distributions from a portfolio and and markets start to get volatile, I I think that tends to be a lot more psychologically challenging. But using Michael's concept of a withdrawal policy statement, I think is great example. is, is, Is yeah, very very powerful. Self-monitoring, set pre-specified intervals for forced check-ins on progress. You know, we, we refer to it as the dentist model. Every time I leave the dentist, I set my next appointment six or nine months down the road. You can do the same thing either with your advisor or on your own. You could review your whole plan on, for example, your birthday or your anniversary. Had a lot of people do that. Education, look for education opportunities in every meeting. So either advisor with a client or client with your advisor. Highlighted is the idea of meta-knowledge or knowing what you don't know. Always be on the lookout for that. And this is something that I get asked a lot. And and certain people do it every meeting. They will ask, is there something I should have asked you that I didn't? Or is there something that I should be concerned about that we did not raise? Great questions. And you know what? Uh, I I know uh, a lot of our clients listen to the podcast and, and, and a lot probably don't, but, um, for, for, for people that do listen to our podcast, it, it, it comes up a lot in, in meetings where someone will say, you know, Hey, I remember in one of the episodes you said this, or your guest said this, what do you actually think about that? Uh, or, or, or should we, should we be applying that to our, to our situation? True. Next one, anticipate a regret. We're living in an era of fear of missing out or FOMO. So his awareness of what others are doing has never been more transparent. So turn this into a nudge by imagining a future that you don't want to miss out on. So I guess it's about creating an illusion of your future, kind of going back to the first example. Create a fear of missing out on what your future might be if you behave better. Hmm. Number nine, systemization. Humans systematically overestimate their willpower and discipline. Automation makes this issue go away. Automation takes away the human tendency to be lazy. For example, set the regular monthly contributions and increase the contributions as soon as you receive a pay increase. Number 10, goal setting. Start and end every conversation with a focus on goals. This will drive the interaction to the specifics of accomplishing the goals. So goals are often very motivational. And since they trigger emotion, they should lead to better behavior. Number 11, look for emotional triggers. We all have triggers. What is yours? Do you envy when you hear a friend bought Tesla shares four months ago? That comes up a fair amount. Certainly, there's a lot of chatter on Twitter about it. Shopping when you've had a bad day at work. Try to understand the situations that lead to these triggers and try to either avoid or manage these situations. Oh geez, so stay off of uh, stay off of Wall Street bets on on Reddit then. I guess so. Uh, Reduce negative prompts. Willpower is weak, therefore, it is better to avoid temptation than to rely on willpower to protect you. I That's a I good do. one. I do that at home. I just don't buy the kind of stuff I know that if it was here I would eat, and if it's not here I can't eat it. <laughs> Number thirteen: behavior substitution. Uh, Going cold turkey on anything is very difficult. This is true of bad financial behavior. So instead of going cold turkey, why not try to replace it with something else, such as healthier behavior? 
So if you have a hard time, one example I thought of, if you have a hard time saving up your regular, let's say $24,000 for RSP contribution, so instead of shocking the system and saving $2,000 a month to get there after a year, maybe start lower and just build it up over time because too much of a shock to a system may cause you to abort the plan. Habit formation and shaping. This is right out of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Take a goal and subdivide it down into a bunch of smaller steps. Don't look at that big number you necessarily need to retire. Break it down into annual or monthly behaviors to get there. Number 15, behavioral re rehearsal. Certain types of behaviors lend themselves nicely to a rehearsal. For example, having a hard conversation about money with a loved one, Daniel says, rehearsal will reduce the nerves, increase proficiency, and anticipate problems before they come up. This one I must when I found a little strange. I can't imagine rehearsing conversations like that. Can you? Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It, I, I, I also thought about rehearsing other, like other bad situations like uh, market downturn, but I think it's pretty hard to predict how you're actually going to feel in that type of, um, that type of situation. That was what, for, for this, this crisis, like I, I also have investments in dimensional equity funds. Um, and when they dropped, however much they dropped, I, I didn't feel a thing. Mm -hmm. I always kind of wondered how I'd feel in a downturn. Not a thing. I don't think any listener is surprised. Did you? Uh, no, I, I, didn't phase me at all. I even watched my son has been very aggressively saving and he was down obviously a fair chunk. He saw equity. He told me a few weeks ago, he's back to break even because he kept buying all the way through. So great, great experience for a young investor like James. I did too. That's a the benefit of automation, I guess. Yeah. Kept, kept on going with the regular savings. Do you want to go through a few here as well? Uh, sure. Yeah. So can consider past outcomes. Uh, there's a quote that Daniel had from Mark Twain. History doesn't repeat itself, but it sure rhymes. And now this is this is for the advisor to do, but I think people can apply it to themselves, like we've been saying. Um, so he's saying that you should look to a client's past financial decisions to understand how they reacted to certain events. And that helps you to inform how they might behave in a future event. And I think it speaks to that idea of, of us not really knowing uh, ourselves that well. But if you look to how you actually behaved in a real bad situation in the past, uh, that, that's probably a better indication of how you're going to behave in the future than how you think you'll feel. I love hearing people describe what they learned from past, especially crises. How did you behave in 2008, 2000? Yeah. Um, uh, pr pros and cons. So he, he says that it, it, in, in, a, in a decision, if you're making a financial decision, something as simple as making a simple uh, t shirt t chart with pros and cons can be useful, and I think that speaks to just the idea of of managing trade offs. Anytime you're making a financial decision, and that's what we spend so much of our time doing is understanding what the trade offs are uh, in the first place, which isn't always easy, and then helping people decide, which is often very subjective between between the set of trade offs that are available. Uh, c comparative imagining of future outcomes. Uh, so Daniel says that you can paint a picture of two paths that their financial life can take and then let them imagine what each one would look like. I think we do that whenever we're going through the financial planning, uh, the, the, the projection portion of the financial planning process with a, with a client. We'll often do that. I don't think we've ever framed it as, you know, imagine these two potential future selves. Um, but we, we definitely go through the quantitative aspect of uh of that. And I think that, you know, that, that makes me think of another thing Michael Kitzes was talking about was the, the, the improper approach of thinking about retirement as an end when it's not really, mm -hmm. it's just a, it's just a transition. And the idea that there are a lot of alternatives, like instead of, um, doing the fire lifestyle and saving as much as you possibly can, an alternative would be finding something that you could do earning less income, um, and maybe save less, but work, uh, work longer. Anyway, yeah. So com comparing, comparing and imagining future outcomes like that. Uh, st stress management. So he had a Daniel had a statistic in here that I, I hadn't seen before, but he said under stress we lose thirteen percent of our cognitive capacity. So you have you have the the, the least access 
to your ability to think when you arguably need it the most. I love and this his, example. I, I think it's, it's so good. It is good. Um, so he, he's his suggestion is that stress management, which is not necessarily related to your finances, but things like uh, working on your well-being, your diet, and, and exercising, which are all useful for managing stress, can all be really important in making better financial decisions. It kind of takes the whole the whole idea of financial wellness full full circle. Uh, framing. We talked about this in a past episode. I can't remember which one, but the the idea that the the way that a decision is framed will will affect uh, what someone decides to do. It absolutely will. I mean, the example that he gave was when asked if they could save 20% of their salary, most people say, no way, I can't save that. But when asked if they could live off 80% of their, their income, most said, sure. So good. Incredible. And then, I mean, the one that we live often is disability insurance. So many people say, oh, I can't afford that cost for disability insurance. And it's like, think about it. If you can't afford to get it, how can you afford not to get it? Because if you become disabled, you have no income. Like it's the great irony, right? Yeah. Anyway, carry on. Uh, identification of self as a role model. So Daniel says people often act recklessly towards themselves, but far more generously towards others. Uh, on our own, we may, we may be more reckless, but if others are watching us, then we, we might treat, treat things more uh, seriously. So there's an opportunity to, um, yeah, well, view, view yourself the way that you would want other people to view you, I guess, which might lead to better decision making. And the last one in his list of 22 nudges was to conduct a pre-mortem. So instead of a post-mortem where you're looking at uh, why things went, went wrong after they've happened, a pre-mortem is looking at what things could possibly go wrong uh, and maybe put a plan together to address that. And we talked with um, Patty Lovett reed in our past episode about that idea of having a backup, a backup uh, financial plan. We'd actually talked to Patty about a lot of these things. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's it. 22, 22 nudges that can help you be a, a better investor. And shout out to Daniel for that. So on to bad advice of the week. We had some fun a couple of weeks ago talking about that TMZ article. Kind of on the similar vein this week, we're talking about a couple of pieces of financial wisdom from TikTok. I'm not an avid TikTok user. My daughter is. Do you use TikTok, Ben? <laughs> I'm not. No, no. Not a t- uh, no I don't. Are you a TikTok talker? I don't know if that's what it is or not. Anyway, so... Um, Apparently there's a whole Twitter feed of people giving financial advice on TikTok. $100 into a million dollars in one year just by doing this. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna teach you how to trade options in the stock market with proper risk management and trading large companies such as Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Tesla, Amazon, and so on. No penny stocks, no small stocks. We're gonna trade large companies and we're gonna aim for 20% return every single week. In the options world, it is very doable to do it. So what we're going to do is $100 turns into 120 then 144 then 172 by week four doing 20% consistent gains. And by the end of the year, a million dollars in your account. This is very doable, but you have to learn how to trade options with proper risk management. And I'm here to teach you strategies on how to do options and how to do it properly and how to do it for all beginners. If you know nothing about the stock market, right? All you need to do is click on my profile, subscribe to my website. You get a welcome email with my free groups links. We have over 34,000 members and we're all here to help. So I'll see you in there. So I honestly thought these were jokes, but apparently not. I I don't profess to be the resident TikTok expert. So if someone knows that these are are hoaxes, please let me know. But wow, unbelievable what people are promoting on TikTok. I can't believe that they're not jokes. Like I feel like we're being trolled and that we're you know, old, old people that are out of touch with what the young people are talking about. And, and this is all just a joke. And now we're going to be foolish for thinking it was real, but I think it's actually real. I don't know. I don't know what to believe. A hundred bucks and a million bucks in one year, 20% every week. Very doable. (laughs) Makes me laugh. Type it in your calculator. Take a hundred times 1.06 and do it 90 times. Okay. Anyways. It's unreal. Clearly, we don't think you should get your investment advice from TikTok. 
good for entertainment, I guess. I wonder what's going on over there, though. Like, the, I started seeing these probably two months ago. I saw one, and now they've started to pop up more. And then, like you said, Cameron, now someone's created a Twitter account that's just posting this awful TikTok financial advice. Like, what's going on there? I don't I wonder know. what's going on. I don't it doesn't know. make any sense. I don't know the revenue model. Does the revenue all go to them if you subscribe? Is TikTok in on it? I have no idea. I don't know. It's absurd. Like, the, the, I, I, I don't have the, the name of the Twitter account, but it's... It's unbelievable, the stuff that people are putting on the internet. Hopefully not too many people are, are using it as uh, as actual advice. I don't know. Anyway, good thing is like, we got a chance to meet uh, Dan and Tasmadian for the first one. And there you go. It's going around the world. So you want to queue up your interview with uh, with Tim? Yeah, so that's it for for Cameron and I's part of this episode. But we, we did have that conversation with Tim uh, that we wanted to include here. So I, I originally wanted to talk to Tim about Wealth Simple's new uh, sustainable portfolios. So they've actually created some ETFs uh, that they're using for their portfolios. So they they didn't feel that there were suitable products to use to create a, a good sustainable portfolio. So they went and created their own. Obviously, their integration with uh, Power Corp helps them do things like that. I think they're, they're actually McKenzie Funds, which is also a Power Corp company. Uh, anyway, so Tim had his feedback on those funds and then we also talked a little bit about just just the 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 state of sustainable investing which we alluded to a little bit in our portfolio topic cool well thanks for listening and let's go listen to you and tim's conversation tim thanks for coming back on the podcast thanks so much for having me so lots of people know that we like to pick on wealth simple's model portfolios and they they recently released a new uh socially responsible or sustainable uh, model portfolio. And so I wanted to have you on to talk about it. So let's, uh, let's do it. Sure. Uh, so, you know, I wasn't a big fan of their first socially responsible portfolio. You know, when they launched it in, I think it was 2016, I opened it up and it really seemed like it was a mishmash of different strategies. They had a sort of a low carbon ETF that had tobacco and gambling and, and weapons. And then they had a lot of the socially responsible ETFs that got rid of that stuff, but had fossil fuels in there. So it was one of these things where by trying to be sort of everything to everybody, they ended up pissing everybody off because there was something in the portfolio, whatever your values were, that, that you would be unhappy with. So, um, you know, it was interesting to kind of follow their journey I think that they recognized that, that it wasn't perfect. I think they were getting a lot of negative feedback from it. And unfortunately, there weren't a lot of ETFs for a long time. It kind of has taken a while for the industry to evolve. So they probably hit a tipping point. I don't know where it was, but I would guess about you know two, two and a half years ago, where they just decided they needed to switch. There were no products that were really a good fit for them at that time. So they decided to build their own ETFs, which is bold. You know, and I will give them credit for, you know, really going out there and creating something, you know, a different uh, business model for them in, in actually building their own ETFs. So I uh, was really excited when they launched. I'd sort of heard rumors that they were coming. They filed a prospectus. And then finally, when they did launch uh, earlier this year, uh, I think it was in June of this year, uh, uh, yeah, mid-June. And I've just got the methodology in front of me. So I'll just run through it for viewers or listeners real quick. Basically, they get rid of a lot of negative screens here. So big polluters uh, like oil and gas related companies. So that means they're also excluding uh, uh, pipelines and refineries, things like that. Any companies involved in thermal coal mining or coal power generation. And then they've also admitted the top 25% of carbon emitters in each industry. So they go through sector by sector, knock off the bottom 25%. From there, they also get rid of any uh, uh, companies with any major violations, so like human rights or child labor, things like that, as well any defense contractors, weapon manufacturers. They get rid of tobacco, alcohol, casino, gaming, adult nightclub, and entertainment companies. And then this, to me, is, is probably the most uh, strict measure that they have, is they only include companies that have either three plus women on the board of directors, board of directors, or twenty five percent representation 
on the board of directors. And that is just a really, really uh, a bit an outlier when it comes to the responsible investment industry. I've seen one ETF on the market that uh, requires at least one woman on the board. This is the first time I've ever seen such strong representation um, uh, uh, on that issue. So, you know, really, I would say that is sort of the, the, where they're hanging their hat or, you know, the hill they're willing to die on, if you want to look at it that way, that it really is about gender representation. Um, and that does exclude about 60% of the eligible universe, wow. which I know you're not going to be thrilled about, but yeah. really their hope is by shining a light on this, that there will be a little bit of activism involved that companies are going to be incentivized to be able to have more gender uh, representation on the board. What's interesting is when they launched, it was right as uh, the, the, the racial justice protests were, were very strong in the U.S. So a lot of questions around that, that that certainly was not part of their lens. And they've suggested that they're, they are open to updating their methodology. They're working with a third-party index provider called Selective. So they can really sort of customize the index. And it wouldn't surprise me if it does evolve as time goes on. So the end result is that, you know, you do get these two very broad-based ETFs, one for North America, one for developed markets, X North America. Um, the, the diversification isn't great. Overall, I think there are about 240 companies across the two ETFs. Across um, both so combined. Across both combined. The North wow. American one is heavier. The reason they didn't do Canada and US sort of differentiating there is there weren't enough Canadian companies sure. that passed that gender screen. So that's why they went the North American route. And when you look at the developed ex North America, there's a lot of exposure to Northern Europe. So the sort of Scandinavian countries and Northern European countries makes and sense. Less yeah. exposure to, you know, the other sort of EAFE regions. Wow. So, I mean, that, that, that's a good sort of recap of what the products are. What are, what are your thoughts and opinions? Yeah, I mean, I'm thrilled that they did this. Uh, I think that they are really pushing the agenda forward, which makes me really happy that I think we need more leaders. And certainly I would say what they've done here is fairly bold um, in terms of what they're doing from the ethical standpoint. Um, there are, it's not perfect. So, you know, to me, the issues that, that I have with it is number one, they don't use ESG, broad ESG scores. They would agree with you in the sense that there's so much discrepancy between the different rating agencies that they're just like, screw it, we're not going to use ESG methodology. To me, that's a problem because it does mean that certain companies will sneak through mm. if, you know, provided they, they have gender uh, representation on the board, provided their carbon footprints aren't horrible. You know, one of the red flags in there for me, and again, it's not going to be for everyone, but I think it's a telling company, is Amazon. That when I look at the way Amazon treats their employees, and certainly during COVID, you know, that, that there are some issues here. And, uh, you know, a lot of those labor rights issues just simply aren't really addressed by the methodology. It's never going to escalate to the point where it's like a human rights abuse, right? But, you know, so many of these questions around the gig economy, you're seeing Uber in California right now that is just like, I don't know what's going to happen there as their uh, gig economy workers are being classified as employees and they're sort of threatening to shut down over that. Is the business model sustainable if those are actually employees and Amazon with their delivery services, things like that? So, you know, really, it's not going to be perfect. Uh, I would urge people to look at the holdings to see if there are any red flags in there because there are sort of a few head scratchers in there from, from my perspective. But overall, I mean, you know, I'm just thrilled. I think that robo-advisors do play a really strong role in the investment landscape, that for a certain segment of people who are just getting started, you know, they are just so much better than mutual funds uh, uh, from a fees perspective. So, Definitely. you know, there really wasn't a, a robo-option for, you know, people that wanted to divest from fossil fuels. And now there is. So to me, overall, This is really bigger too, right? It. It's bigger too. It's not like, because they made ETFs. That's right. So you can get them through the robo-advisor option, but you can also just buy the ETFs, You right? can just buy them directly. You got it. So, you know, and now there is more of a landscape. iShares has come out with their fossil fuel-free ETFs. You know, there is more, there are more options available. The spectrum of options has gotten wider with many more options in there for different investors. And so this would add to that. They're also very low cost, you know, with Wealthsimple. I'm sure these are loss leaders. 
uh, they are using a multi-factor approach. So, you know, I know in terms of fees, a custom index, you know, all this stuff suggests that they should be more expensive, but while simple is keeping them really nice and cheap, I think around uh, 0 0.2, 0.25% wow. uh, um, for the MERs. So, you know, really to me, more choice is always a great thing that the ease of use here is fantastic. Uh, I don't really see a downside for them, except that obviously they're not going to be for every single investor. They will go too far for some of your listeners. They will go not far enough for many of my clients. Right. Right. And so it's really about figuring out where you are on that spectrum and whether these are appropriate for you. That's awesome. Okay. That was great. Now, before we end this, I know you had some comments on uh, when, when we had Ken French on for episode 100, he yeah. spoke about ESG. Um, and I know you wanted to respond to that a little bit. So if we could do that too, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. So first of all, like you guys have been getting some awesome guests lately. I'm enjoying the podcast so much. Great. It's been great to get Ken French for your hundredth episode. Like, I don't know how planned that was or whether it was serendipitous, but that was just so cool. And, you know, really have so much respect for him. And I loved his answer. First of all, I was thrilled you asked him. I was really happy about that. And then I loved his answer and he really kind of wore two hats. He said, as a human, I love it. Like sustainable investing, this is important. This is great. I'm all for it. This is great. But as a finance professor, you know, wearing that hat, I've got some problems with it. And to me, that is the fundamental issue that, you know, and I was so happy to hear him sort of have those, those two different hats, as I like to call them, because, you know, really it speaks to me the problem of sort of mainstream finance as it relates to ESG. And really what happens is that as soon as he puts on that finance professor hat, it becomes a very simple equation for him. And he even spoke to this, that there's like one diagram, which is that, you know, as there is a higher preference that pushes up prices, which lowers long-term expected returns. The problem with that overly simple formula is that it makes a very common mistake, which is to completely ignore social and environmental issues and dismiss them as quote unquote externalities. Whereas in my mind, and so much evidence is starting to show that these are financially material issues, that these are not externalities, that they have a bearing on a company's uh, profitability and share price performance. So, you know, to me, it just, I, 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 I was a little bit disappointed that, you know, really I felt that the, the, the thinking on this issue is sort of overly simplistic, that as we start to move towards a more sustainable society, and I think that COVID has really shone a light on a lot of the income disparity issues, and I think we're going through a fundamental repricing of assets such that, you know, things like tech and, and education and healthcare are so much more valuable. We're starting to realize that actually these are more valuable. And, and that also on the climate change side that, you know, we really have seen a decline of the broad energy sector where, you know, sort of the carbon bubble is deflating. I don't think it's pop. But when you look at all the write downs of all these assets that a lot of these projects are just not going to get built, they're just not profitable anymore. And so to me, there is this broader societal shift happening. Um, you know, I really love the, the long term approach that he takes. And so I'm a little bit hesitant to talk about sort of short term politics. But I, I will say that it looks like the Canadian government, you know, uh, is going to be moving towards sort of a green recovery. Um, you know, I want to sort of knock on wood. I don't want to jinx anything with the U.S. election, but Joe Biden has presented a two trillion dollar climate plan that really I think that we are about to go through a, a major repricing of assets that incorporate both a social and environmental lens. And so to use an overly simplistic model that completely dismisses those, in my mind, very material issues, uh, to me, kind of misses a big uh, a, a big part of the theory behind why ESG investing, I think, is so is so popular, is growing so quickly, and could be very profitable. The last thing I'll say is that, you know, I do appreciate this perspective that it is a preference, right? And he did admit there is utility for people to feel good about their investments. He, thank you for acknowledging the warm fuzzies, as I call them, are a real thing, and there is value there. But I would also say that if your fear is that those preferences have taken over and the assets are overpriced, you know, to me, you really have to look at the overall market to see how much those preferences have crept in. 
Um, there, there is a chart that came out by Morningstar showing assets flowing into sustainable funds. And this is a record year that, you know, last year was $20 billion, which was massive. And we've already had $20 billion so far this year. Whereas, you know, previous to this, I think the record was around $4 billion. So it really is sort of that massive growth. But the overall market for ETFs is still $4 trillion, you know, so to put that sort of, you know, $40 billion in context, right, I really think we're still in, I would say, the second inning of this, this rise of ESG preferences. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see over the long term that his theory might come true, that there might be a bubble and overpricing there. I still think we're a long way from that. And I would argue that the, the market is going through a fundamental repricing of assets such that companies that take these ESG issues seriously and are ahead of the curve will continue to see their share prices appreciate. And I, th- I think uh, sustainable companies as a category have done quite well. Reason- not, not that we can draw a ton of insight from you know, a couple of months, but it is yeah. interesting to see. And I actually came across a paper just right before we started talking uh, that addressed mutual fund performance and flows during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and they also looked at uh, sustainable funds. But one of their conclusions was uh, uh, fund, fund outflows surpass pre-crisis trends for, for active funds, but not dramatically. Investors favor funds that apply exclusion criteria, uh, like uh, ESG exclusion, and funds with high sustainability ratings, especially environmental ones. Our finding that investors remain focused on sustainability during this major crisis suggests that they view sustainability as a necessity rather than a luxury good. Yeah. I thought that and was pretty that's, interesting. And that's it to me that, you know, I think in the 2008, 2009 crisis, you know, sustainability got thrown on the back burner, that it just, it just wasn't important. People were like, no, we've got bigger fish to fry. This time it's staying on the front burner which to me is so exciting. And, you know, and, and, and uh, it's been really interesting to see this idea of, of sort of consumer staples and, you know, a lot of these more defensive sectors that really, they, it's understandable that they would do well during a pandemic. So, you know, part of it is luck. Part of it is the fact that I think that uh, uh, investors are more loyal, that when there is a values component, you know, if someone, I remember Kevin O'Leary had his mutual funds before, you know, if someone's going to invest in a fund from that guy, all they care about is financial performance, a couple bad quarters and they're done. Whereas really when it comes to this values-based approach, I think there is a longer term perspective and there is more loyalty and there is a stricter adherence to this sort of buy and hold psychology, which is obviously a huge barrier for DIY investors. That can be a huge problem. So by connecting it to their values, I think there's a huge advantage here for advisors that kind of want that client loyalty over the long term, that if you can connect with people on that more ethical level, that you know, you're know you going to have a client for life. Which is fascinating too, as it relates to the, like the Ken French type theory, because that's exactly what he's saying, that people will be more willing to hold those assets separate from their risk and expected return characteristics, which, uh, which does help with adherence for sure, but also has a theoretical effect on expected returns, um, which is the, the, the point that you were just talking about. Anyway, totally yeah, fascinating. It's going to be interesting. You know, it's still early days and there's not a huge amount of research. Like we're just now getting to the point where we do have some historic data. So, you know, I'll admit that it is still a little bit of the wild west out here when it comes to this stuff. You know, I do spend a lot of my time working through trade-offs and understanding that these things aren't perfect and preferences are a huge part of that. But, um, you know, really, I'm, I'm super encouraged just both by the, the financial performance that everything is performing, sort of my thesis is holding true, but also in terms of the psychological that I've long felt that the barrier to ad- uh, ad- uh, adoption of ESG investing is not a financial thing. It's a psychological thing that there really are these mental barriers and specifically this myth that returns are going to be awful. And, right. you know, I think you and I are going to disagree about, you know, long-term expected returns and, and sort of exactly where it's going to be. But I think we can both agree now that, you know, you certainly haven't had to sacrifice financial returns and that if there is a, an emerging preference for these issues, that investors, you know, who get in early uh, are going to be ahead of that curve. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's so tricky with expected returns too, right? Because he, like w- the, 
a, a lot of the times these sustainable ETFs will have tilts toward known factors that do drive differences differences in expected returns. So e- even if there's a preference based reduction in expected returns, if you compare a sustainable ETF to a, a just a market cap weighted ETF, just the additional uh, factor exposure might bring it back to even in terms of expected returns or more so. So I, I don't exactly. think it's as easy as saying they're going to have lower expected returns, especially when you're comparing it to a market cap weighted index. It's like a, like a theoretical um, risk adjusted lower expected return, but that doesn't necessarily equate to lower investor returns. <laughs> Actual returns for people who have invested. So, you know, it's going to be interesting, but, but I just love that the conversation is continuing to drive forward. Um, I'm seeing a lot of encouraging signs when, when it comes to markets really adopting this, the Task Force for Financial Related Climate Disclosures, this awful acronym that, you know, now I can look at banks' balance sheets and see what their carbon risk exposure is. That the amount of data that I have available to me now is great. And I'm just hoping that academic researchers are picking up on this as well. I'm sure they are, but I think over the next few years, you know, we're going to start to see more academic papers. We're going to start to see more of this sort of deeper analysis that will, you know, we never know where things are going. Either one of us has that crystal ball. But I think that, that I'm certainly very encouraged, having been looking at this for 10 or 12 years now, you know, that really finally, I do feel the momentum is here, that this is uh, the conversations that are happening are so much more informed and so much more fruitful than they were even just a few years ago. Yeah. All right. Let's leave it there. Thanks, Tim. We, uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much for having me.